a throbbing commercial administrative center for a region of two and a half million people. It's for me the warmth and involvement of people with each other. It's where my blood circulates. A bit behind the times, I'm afraid. It's a great place. It's the only city I want to live. I think perhaps it's every bit as big as one mouse. We've put up with a lot. It's a place that has to be seen through the eyes of love. To begin with, an ancient city, tradition tells us, founded almost 1,500 years ago on the banks of a stream, the Molendiner, near where it flows into the River Clyde, near a ford across that river and on the rim of a dying Roman Empire. Here the legend tells us the city's patron saint, Mungo Kentigan, bore the body of a holy man called Fergus on a bullock cart. Fergus had asked that his body be buried where the cart stopped. The first, but not the last time, that transport was to play a part in the city's history. St. Mungo founded a monastery. The city was an isolated, a holy place. Glesho, or Glasho, as Glasgow was then called, is variously taken to mean the dear community, as Mungo called his monastery, or the dear green place. By the 13th century, a cathedral town. Early in the 18th century, Daniel Defoe said, Glasgow is the beautifulest little city I have seen in Britain. It stands deliciously on the banks of the River Clyde. A different Glasgow from the one we know. Then sudden wealth from the tobacco trade with the American colonies of a new empire, the British Empire. Fortunes were lost when they revolted. But Glasgow was well placed for sea trade with the new American Republic. Fortunes were made again, weaving cotton. The wealth accumulated was the base for vast, undreamed expansion to come. The city was larger now, but still an isolated place. London, even by fast stagecoach, was almost two days' journey away. The railways ended all that. There was a frenzy of building and development throughout Britain. Glasgow was affected as much as anywhere else. The city's first passenger line opened in the 1830s. By 1850, you could take a train to Greenock or Edinburgh, and of course London, now less than 12 hours away. The cast-iron masterpieces of Victorian architecture and hotels to go with them erupted in the city. They were the Aladdin's caves of a new age of magic, the age of the railway. The Industrial Revolution, the 60 glorious years were underway. A tunnel under the centre pushed the city mainly west to the elegant new homes of an emergent middle class. But it was the tram car that really spread the city. Before then, most people walked to one. By 1890, 20 years after they started, the trams carried five million people a year. They were an essential part of the city life with their own folklore, they rattled, and they shook, and Glasgow loved them. And suburban railways had to cut their services. By the 1920s, 50 million people a year used them. Mass travel for Glasgow people had arrived. But the railway had made way for a new industrial age. It needed iron for engines, rails, bridges, stations in enormous quantities. Blast furnaces in the city went up from 25 to 100 in the 10 years after the first trains ran. And others followed. Dear old dusty Glasgow, as people affectionately began to call it, was replacing the dear green place. 
Glasgow built more locomotives than any other city in Britain, and possibly in the world. Victorian confidence never doubted the wisdom of this. But it was on the Clyde that Glasgow made a reputation that carried to the ends of the earth. The techniques of the railway were used to make iron and later steel ships. High built came to mean something special. By 1914, it's reckoned a third of all the world's steamships were launched here. And there were more shipbuilding jobs than any other. Glasgow, as they say, made the Clyde, and the Clyde made Glasgow. But it was no longer the dear green place, no longer isolated. In 50 years, the population, including suburbs, went up four times from a quarter of a million to a million people. Now truly the second city of an empire on which the sun apparently would never set. A solid, prosperous Glasgow with its own style. A European style, closer to Paris or Prague or Vienna than most British cities. Park Circus on Woodlands Hill above Kelvin Grove. A high point in Victorian design, not only in Glasgow, but in Britain. Further west, Grosvenor Terrace. And Great Western Terrace. Designed by Alexander Thompson. Greek Thompson. One of the few Glasgow architects to be known by name. Thompson also designed this church in the style that gave him his nickname. But in the building explosion from the 50s to the 90s, most of Glasgow's unknown architects were busy building in the uniform style that's characteristic of the city. One that carried 18th century grace into the 19th. Mostly tenement buildings. Four stories high to a height of about 40 feet and made of grey ashlar. A local stone more often honey-coloured than grey. But as the railways, then the trams, pushed the city further out, the city was rapidly becoming a desert of tenements. Several fine parks were built as relief from all this stonework. But one park was there before them all. Jack House. Glasgow Green is the oldest public park in Britain. It was a public park as far back as the 16th century and uh, it's different from, the, for example, the Royal Parks of London because they're royal. This was always a democratic park, typical of Glasgow. Now, just at the entrance, you come to the Dalton Fountain. Now, the Dalton Fountain is a, a relic of the very first uh, international exhibition held in Glasgow in 1888. You come next to Nelson's Monument, which is the very first monument ever uh, erected to Admiral Lord Nelson, long before any of his compatriots thought of it, uh, we did in Glasgow, and it was put up in 1870. From the uh, Nelson's Monument, you walk through Glasgow Green, and you see a very peculiar building, the uh, Templeton's Carpet Factory, where the golden carpets for two coronations were woven. Templeton's Carpet Factory was built in the style of the Doge's Palace in Venice. And if you go to Moscow and have a look at the Kremlin, one of the things that occurs to you is that the Kremlin looks so like Templeton's Carpet Factory. Which is interesting because actually Red Square is slightly to the south of George Square in Glasgow. From Templeton's Carpet Factory over to the River Clyde is a, a place which was formerly Arne's Well. At one time, people in Glasgow got their water from a, a various number of contaminated wells or from the River Clyde, which was even worse than the wells. And then in 1865, they brought in the water from Loch Catrin, which is regarded as probably the finest drinking water you'll get anywhere. But quite a lot of people wouldn't drink it. They preferred the old well water. And there was an old lady who lived in Monteith Row who used to cross Glasgow Green every day to collect her two pails of water from Arne's well because she said this newfangled water from the tap had neither taste nor smell. The lore of old Glasgow still survives in this 17th century steeple. It's part of the merchant's house in what was once the most fashionable street in the city. The 
merchants used to watch from here for their cargoes coming up the river. But by the 19th century, the steeple was all that remained of the building. The rest was rebuilt as Glasgow's fish market, in a style that was maybe meant to stop people thinking about the smell of fish. Nearby, a different market, Paddy's Market. In the hungry 40s of the last century, impoverished Irish refugees from the potato famine came here straight from the Irish boats. They bought and sold what they could in their struggle to survive. The market's due for demolition soon, and some people think not before time. Rosie, the last of four generations of ragwomen. The market's been her life. Paddy's market. Paddy's market, well, the only one thing I can say about Paddy's market, to me, I think it's the most friendly wee place in the whole of Glasgow. Because there's people from down here, you know, working class people. That's all I can say about Paddy's market, really. Although you do get the intellectuals, but they sort of just come down to see, they've heard so much about it. But the people who come down to Paddy's market are wonderful. And to me, it's the most friendliest. I could say dirtiest. Don't like the kid was there. It's nothing sort of nice to look at. But the people that's in Paddy's market have made Paddy's market what it is today. People like myself, they've made it a friendly. Just a place that people can come with very little money in their purses. I know they'll go home with a purchase. It's only costing a couple of shillings. It's a wonderful place and I'll be awful sorry to see it go. In fact, I think they're a better word than that. I think I'll be awful sad. Because when Paddy Market goes, a great big part of our life shall go with it. At the dawning of the day, people come and tell us go away. We don't want to like drown here. You bring the disease and to our children here. And this town is not your own. So once more we roll. How to face a cruel winter sun Land of saints and scholars We have lost our precious gift of charity And don't recognize our own A song in a bar near the market. A meeting place for folk singers, writers and poets like Freddie Anderson. An Irish Glaswegian, he's made the time of the abortive Weavers' Rebellion of 1820 his own. In poems like this about the weavers who died for the cause of radical reform. Ending of it, you know, the, uh, yeah. and, uh, I think it sums it up. You know? Good. Good. As we came in by Stirling, you'd hear the clank and chain. The poor gone cart and weaver lads at Bunny Moor were taken. The hang to in the castle, burden hardy with their names, when turned to mould as Richmond's gold, untarnished lives their fame. The rest of one iron's trapped, banished o'er the waves. Neath the southern stars and lands afar, you'll find the lonely graves. And Jimmy Wilson the Straven Vale, a man advanced in years, at Glasgow Cross his life he lost amidst the people's tears. For well, bold cat and weaver lads, on Castle Ray my curse. For well, my bunny burns all, though my heart is like to burst. For well, bold lad to Glasgow, who died your land to save. Old Scotia's rose, in blossom grows, above the weaver's grave. Well done. Yes! That thumbs up. Yes, Excellent. Excellent. Oh. First one.
The weavers who died are commemorated on this gravestone in a cemetery in the north of the city. They were the archetypal Scottish working men, well-informed, well-read and politically radical. Some of the reforms they and others died for were already won by the time the Kelvin Grove Park in the West End was opened in 1853. The park was designed by Sir Joseph Paxton of Crystal Palace fame. He's one of more than 60 in Glasgow that give some relief from the endless, airless tenements. The River Kelvin is a superb natural feature. And of course, there's a bandstand. Built in 1870, a fountain commemorates the Loch Catlin scheme to provide the new fangled water without taste or smell. The same year, Glasgow's medieval university moved west to make way for a railway station. The Kelvin Grove Museum and Art Galleries were the finest collection in Britain outside of London, built for an exhibition in 1901. Next door, the prodigal, prosperous Victorians also built this building only to demolish it afterwards. But the architecture of business had already reflected this prosperity. This graceful iron flame warehouse near the River Clyde was built in 1850, a pioneer building in Britain, and one of several similar designs in Glasgow. And the banks were the temples of the new commercial spirit that flowed into the city tributes in stone to the classical past, with a Glasgow accent. But there was a hint of future trouble for Glasgow's apparently solid prosperity. In 1878, commercial confidence was shaken by the fall of the city of Glasgow Bank. Directors of the bank were imprisoned for fraud. Many local people were ruined. Many others, the majority, were unaffected. Grinding poverty was their lot in any case. But commerce quickly recovered. In a few years, the new city chambers were built. Ornate and solid, they looked, as they still do, as if they were trying to prove that Glasgow, as its motto says, was flourishing. And flourish it did, with a variety of office building until the 20th century. But as the building showed, there was a gradual loss of the solid confidence that kept the early Victorians going. This was reflected in buildings like the gracefully freakish one known as the Hat Rack. Many of the office blocks were tall in the 20th century style, and sometimes the backs of these were more modern than their ornate fronts, a echo of the future. And one man's work echoed the future more than anyone else's, Charles Rennie Mackintosh. The Glasgow School of Art, completed in 1909, is reckoned his masterpiece. It's said to be the most famous building in Glasgow, and for its time, one of the most famous in the world. The front of the school shows the kind of building it is. Its huge studio windows are traps for the steady north light that painters and sculptors need to do their work. The whole building is full of unexpected rooms and corridors. It's an adventure to look round it. And although some parks look unusual, much of it is built in a style that looks natural in a Scottish setting. Mackintosh himself saw his work as traditionally Scottish. Other parts of the school look surprisingly up to date for a building designed some 70 years ago. Mackintosh was among the first of the modern architects. The library is a much admired section of the building that illustrates Mackintosh's superb handling of interior space. Like many Scots artists, Mackintosh was better known abroad than in Scotland or England. He died in London in 1928, aged 60 unhonored and almost unsung. But the School of Art remains as his manifesto and his monument. 
By the time the School of Art was complete, most of Victorian Glasgow was built. Perhaps the most successful part was the West End, for those who lived there, that is. It's still generally both beautiful and livable, and well worth recording in paint. Jim Morrison. Well, I've been, I've been painting Glasgow all my painting life. I was brought up and lived for a fair time in the West End here. And uh, obviously I react very much to those very beautiful Victorian terraces. I think that this is the, the most attractive part of Glasgow. This is the most attractive face of the city. But I think one also has to remember the other aspect of it. I remember painting down about uh, Calvin Hoff Street and seeing a really rather elegant facade. Interesting relationships of window to wall space and so on, the kind of things that contemporary architects talk about. But in this particular area, a bomb had fallen during the war and knocked a great hole in the, in the line of buildings. You could see around through the back. And there, the ghastly shambles of uh, undressed stone, exterior plumbing, and all the other horrors of, of, of Glasgow slum living were, were quite apparent. Glasgow is still, for me, all things said and done, a, a very beautiful place, very much a painter's place. And here in, in Crown Terrace today, the sun is shining. It's, it's very, very beautiful in the sunlight. But more frequently, I, I, I paint it, and I would almost prefer to paint it in winter time when the trees are bare and when the sky is gray. Because then, for me, it, it, it fully expresses the character of the city. And then it's really something to paint, a real challenge, fascinating uh, with the relationship of the organic shapes of bare trees against the rectangular quality of all this architecture. Of course, there's more to Glasgow than bare trees against rectangular architecture. There are tensions from the past. As the city expanded, refugees from the Highland Clearances and starving Ireland poured in. The root of a deep animosity to Roman Catholics that has softened, but not yet disappeared with time. Glasgow's Orangemen still parade in their 17th century regalia to celebrate the Battle of the Boyne in 1690. But today, whatever the intentions of the walkers with the long memories, the rest of Glasgow treats the occasion as a gala day in the sun. And in any case, without those thousands of immigrants, there would have been no Victorian economic miracle. Their brawn and brain helped to make a new prosperity that poured out of the sun bust of 19th century capitalism. <laughs> And as the face of the earth changed, there were more tensions. Glasgow's enormous new population was housed in conditions that were and are crushingly anti-human. For the price of a middle-class villa in the mid-19th century, say 5,000 pounds, a tenement to house 40 families could be built. The real cost in terms of stunted and distorted lives is immeasurable. Glasgow's reputation for mindless violence doesn't match the violence of such inhuman living conditions. A specialty of tenement life. The one-room family flat or single end. Many still exist. There are flats with more rooms, but most of them are too small and poorly equipped for decent family life. The tenements weren't badly built, but their cramped conditions made them slums of necessity. Sanitary arrangements are basic. Three, four or more families, not people but families, share the same water closet. 
there are no bathrooms, often no hot water. A middle class family will not tolerate these conditions for even as long as a weekend, and rightly so. Yet for more than a century, hundreds of thousands of Glasgow families, the majority, have had to live without enough toilet space, fighting space, or loving space. That so many contrive to live decently is a tribute to the humanity and courage of countless, nameless Glasgow parents and their children. And despite all today's efforts, there still aren't enough new houses for them. The economic miracle that had changed so much was running out of steam, even before the First World War. Britain was no longer the workshop of the world. But this was not obvious in the Edwardian interlude, although the signs of war were everywhere. The Clyde was busy, full of warships built in the yards that kept Glasgow going. Locomotives were still moving out to the railways of the world. Nobody worried about the city's over-dependence on heavy industry when it meant jobs and, of course, profits. And when the war came, more prosperity. But short-lived and bitter as the losses of war outweighed the profits. The war over, Glasgow's dependence on heavy industry caused the city to suffer more than most in the slump that followed and a new army appeared, the unemployed. With empty bellies instead of rifles, they marched to London to ask for the return of their human dignity. The Victorian explosion was over, but Glasgow would be a long time picking up the bits. The shipyards fell silent, and as unemployment mounted to colossal levels, another more militant army formed in the streets the Glasgow gangs. Young men with no future and no direction in their lives gave the city a legendary reputation for violence. They fought, sometimes in hundreds, sometimes to the death, in the mean grey environment that was their heritage. Soon there were heroes in another war, doing much the same thing to Hitler's gangs. The unemployment problem for the moment was solved. But even in today's relative prosperity, the legacies of unemployment and violence remain. And so does another related problem. Glasgow still has the reputation of being a place where too much drink is taken. When there's not enough room at home, when work or no work has become too much, when life's lived a precarious week at a time, then a dram or two on a Friday or Saturday night helps. Scotsman are volatile and violent, violently friendly above all. And Glasgow men are Scotsmen only more so, any night of the week. They drink violently and they argue violently, but not by any means pointlessly. I'm only a young man, right? Now, if I go out there, they can train me. Where they can't train an average. If you see what I mean, you get my point. They're there to this day, they've been there two and a half years. And they're coining it, and I'm telling you they're coining it. I'm telling you. Well, listen, I'll tell you. much more, Bill. Uh, 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 no, my mother in law and father's. I hear the stories again. And I know how long it took. I know, too. I hear the stories. No, I waited about three years. I remember 40 years ago. From the labourer. 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 Glasgow people love one another violently, and when they fight, believe it. I believe that all cities are potentially violent, and Glasgow has the ingredients which commonly lead to violence. Professor Mackey, St. Mungo Professor of Surgery at Glasgow Royal Infirmary. The biggest city, with a large, rather mixed population, with big income and social gradients. It is industrial, it has a big transient population, it is a seaport and has quite a, a large foreign population too. 
at the moment, Glasgow would seem to be almost a non-violent city and certainly in no way comparable with what it seemed to be about two years ago. The, um, each weekend, Dow Hospital, which receives most of the victims of violence in the Glasgow area, we get from 15 to 20 people who have been injured in brawls or assaults. Most of them are quite minor cases. The great majority are drunk. And uh, that drink seems to be a major factor in the situation. But pubs apart, there's one place where the Glasgow man can really get rid of his feelings. Glasgow is, was, and maybe always will be, fit boy daft. Cliff Henley. There are actually people in Glasgow who don't give a hoot about football. But these people, like myself, must be dismissed as untypical and even blasphemous when you consider what sport means to the archetypal Glaswegian. And when I say sport, I'm using the word in its Glasgow sense, which means football, all football, and nothing but football. Now, your Glasgow football fiend does vary in his psychology, from the complacent loyalty of the Clyde supporter to the calm and resolute fatalism of the Partick Thistle mob. But the basic and the true quality is expressed in the horrifying and hilarious passion of Celtic and Rangers, even among those fans who don't express their enthusiasm in long-distance beer bottles. Some people say religion should never have been brought into soccer. They've got it back to front. Soccer is the religion, and the stadium is its temple. Visiting at a game is an act of worship with its own idols and icons. They even sing hymns. Well, I suppose you could call them hymns. And they quite fancy a human sacrifice, for that matter. The other thing we have to admit is that this is not a beautiful city, as people think of beauty. It's grim and it's grimy, and life has always been gay-hard and unglamorous. The human spirit, ground down by industrialism, demands a life with something epic in it, something vivid and theatrical, something raw with elemental dramatic conflict. And by gum, that's football in Glasgow the living theatre where everybody writes the script and everybody has a star part, and the funny lines as well. So it's Glasgow's drama and Glasgow's religion and Glasgow's comedy, Glasgow's escape and Glasgow's self-expression. It is also, and even I have to admit it, a great technical expertise to be a proper fan, to appreciate subtlety and strategy, and you might even say poetry, because to the fan who would never go near a theatre, a great game has more dynamic beauty and rhythm than other people would find in classical ballet. So Glasgow without football would be unthinkable. But then people used to think that about the tramcars. 
until the coming of the motor car, that is. The trams were once considered the best in the world. And that wasn't just Glasgow narrow-mindedness. Experts from all over the world agreed. They were like a moving pavement in the middle of the road until the internal combustion engine put them out of the running. It's been said that major advances in civilization are processes that all but break the societies in which they happen. Well, the motor car is here to prove it. It's like litter when parked, and the car has given us another religion besides football. It has its own wayside shrines, it has produced a dedicated army of acolytes, and it demands sacrifices. On the move, the car is lethal. It has turned shopping centers like Sockey Hall Street into four-lane racetracks. Coming to terms with the car has meant giving into it. There's some hope of reclaiming streets like this in new plans for traffic-free shopping areas in the city. But meantime, the private car has disrupted other, older forms of public transport, and not just the tramway system. Some railway stations are no longer places of magic, but have to suffer the indignity of becoming storage spaces for that upstart, the motor car. The railways have fought back to some extent with the electric suburban services. But just as they smashed their way into the city centre, clearing the slums of the day, the motor car has been repeating the process. Like a giant abstract sculpture, an inner ring road grows in the city, homage to the motor car, and the end of Glasgow as most of us know it. The Kingston Bridge, part of the new ring road, like a massive monument the ancient Egyptians would have been proud of. And a monument it may become. Already experts predict the end of the motor car era. Meantime, the destruction of the old railway city goes ahead. There can't be many people who will regret the clearing of so much of Glasgow's slum property that should have been down years ago. But when we see how much of the city is to be torn down, more than for the 19th century railway, then it's time to start asking questions. Already the planners admit that only half the ring road is being built, with a 10-year wait for the other half. And who knows what the thinking on the motor car will be by then. A side effect of the motorway plans is that other parts of the city are threatened. Great Western Road, for example, the broad and straight highway that runs through the West End and links with the road to Loch Lomond. There are plans to close off some of its junctions and to widen it into a dual carriageway. This would link with the inner ring road until other radial motorways are built. The Director of Planning of the Corporation of Glasgow, R.D. Mansley, the anticipated increase in traffic volumes on Great Western Road over the next few years um, mean that traffic will increase from today's volumes of 20,000 vehicles a day to something of the order of 50,000 vehicles a day or slightly higher. At the present moment in Great Western Road, at the peak hours, people come into the city, duck round the back streets to the extent that the traffic on the, on the residential streets near to Great Western Road is greater than the traffic travelling along Great Western Road. Now that, to my mind, is fundamentally wrong. Traffic should be canalised on its own main route. The other routes should be relegated to their main function as residential streets. Dr George Gordon Browning, convener of the Great Western Road Conservation Committee. I think the Glasgow Corporation's proposals would be completely detrimental to the area as a whole. Everybody knows that, in fact, the buildings themselves are of great merit. But the whole concept of the Great Western Road, with its layout, its topography with the hills and its trees and the proportions between the trees and the gardens and the terraces themselves, 
if the corporation's proposals were carried out, the essential layout would in fact be destroyed. And this, I would think, would cause a great uh, harm to the overall concept of the area. The uh, Great Western Road runs right through the centre of it. Uh, at, the, at the moment, forms in fact the link between the areas on either side, which is well served with schools and uh, other forms of recreation. Now, the, pro the corporation's proposals would in fact cause Great Western Road to be an impassable barrier right down the centre of the road, with crossing limited to a very small number of intersections. And this would severely inhibit the movements of cross traffic off this, this residential area. So Glasgow, a city spawned by the railroad, may be on the verge of destruction by the motor car and the motorway. Where then do we go from here? The Professor of Urban Planning at the University of Strathclyde, R. E. Nicholl. Glasgow's transport system must react and reflect the new growing demands and the new structure for the city and the region. Uh, if we think about Glasgow itself, uh, to start off with, even though we're building the motorways, particularly around the city centre, um, because of congestion and because of demand, in spite of the building motorways, 80% of all movement to the central area must be by public transport in the future. That means public transport by rail and bus, much better public transport facilities. Well, we have um, possibilities within the city centre now, existing underground uh, tunnels which are, are there and can be exploited, but need to be modernised, electrified and linked up with the existing blue train systems. Another possibility. Part of the city's transport system that has survived for more than 70 years, the underground, hasn't changed basically. Original rolling stock, much improved, is still used. It has no escalators and one lift that doesn't often work. It's noisy, drafty and uncomfortable. It's also the fastest, safest and most efficient transport in Glasgow. There's a train every three minutes. They run continuously on outer and inner circles, through the city centre and to stations north, south and west of it. Tracks never cross, and experts say it's a brilliant concept that could offer a solution for future high-speed public transport. A series of circles with interconnecting stations might be one answer. Another, as suggested, is the reuse of railway tunnels under the city centre. Meantime, the tunnels lie abandoned, haunted by the ghosts of Victorian ambition. An ambition that destroyed the dear green place and encased Glasgow in the problems of the railway age. Well, let's be quite clear about one thing. We cannot solve Glasgow's problems within Glasgow. Um, the, the economics of the city are going to change the economic base, the employment must rely on new facilities which are going to become available, exploiting deep water, etc. The renewal of the city, which uh, I'm sure you've heard about, the, the Gorbals and the Hutchison Towns and the Mary Hills, these renewal projects must displace large uh, numbers of people uh, to provide the new hospitals and the new schools, new universities and new motorways. All these will displace people. In fact, it's not only Glasgow, but the other uh, parts of the Clyde Valley are so congested that in my view, something like half a million people have got to be displaced from the centre of the region, which is the Clyde Valley, to the outskirts. So in other words, from the centre here in Glasgow and the Clyde Valley, between now and the end of the century, half a million people have got to move out to the new towns, the expanded areas, and in particular, in my view, the Ayrshire coast. So the Glasgow we knew seems about to slip into history. Half a million people may not want to trip down the Clyde, but locomotives aren't built here anymore, the world doesn't come for a third of its ships, they may have to go. A quieter, emptier river now. There are fewer jobs for dockers and some docks are no longer in use. Modernization has meant the beginning of a move down the river to deep water at Greenock some 20 miles away. A new terminal to handle container cargoes is now in operation there. And again, the unthinkable. A shipyard pulled down for new houses. Glasgow unmaking the Clyde as the Clyde unmakes Glasgow. 
and more changes as the older dance halls give way to the new discotheques. And there we have the three on that one, the little thing entitled It's All Right Now. This is Christy. Dars, your people, dancing daft longer than they've been football daft, know instinctively that the dance is a mime of life itself. The discotheque gives us today's version of that old mime. The discotheque, a product of the electric age and a popular favorite with the children of the age, Tom Ferry. Yes, I think that is true of uh, discotheques today being very, very popular with the young people. One finds that in a discotheque, uh, there's a great atmosphere, an atmosphere that you don't have in big halls. One gets a chance to meet more friends in uh, a smaller place and uh, who usually find that uh, with good discos, you have a great sound system, great lighting, and people can really lounge about in comfort and really enjoy themselves. I think we could do it a lot more of them. The values the young celebrate are informal and all involving. The values of the instant throwaway world of pop, a classless world of many possibilities and no tomorrows. It seems a long way from this world to the solid obstacle of Glasgow's greatest problem, housing. Many solutions have been tried. In the 30s, garden suburbs. In the 40s and 50s, yesterday's answer, a recreation of crowded tenement life. Huge housing estates were built on Glasgow's last available land, but they lacked city amenities, shops, pubs, cinemas. They were social and cultural wastelands, ghettos for the working class. This type of housing ended at the Green Belt, where the city ran out of land. Glasgow's expansion was over. The dear green place was only a memory. A later solution. Vertical instead of horizontal streets, and built in cleared areas of the city itself. Despite the playgrounds, people complain they're isolated from their children and suffer high living blue. They say there aren't enough lifts, and when help is needed sometimes, it can't come to your door, only to the bottom of your lift shaft. Streets don't mean the same when there are streets in the sky. But like grass breaking through concrete, the human spirit manifests itself among the towers of these new communities. This school band parades in the Gorbals area, the once notorious Gorbals. This is now part of a city redevelopment scheme costing more than a hundred million pounds. This massive rebuilding begins to look like the Victorian explosion all over again, and people, including the planners, are already beginning to ask if this is the way to rebuild the city. How much should we destroy? How much preserve and modernize? Are tower blocks the answer to Glasgow's rehousing problems? And what about the thousands who must wait years for a decent home because rebuilding takes so long? So before we replace one lot of concentrated real estate with another, perhaps the time has come to listen to the young, who want to keep the options open and tackle our problems now rather than in the future who question the decisions of authority everywhere because they believe we should all have a say in them. Perhaps there's a strategy there for all of us. Otherwise, future generations may wonder at the energy that created so many concrete stone hinges. Glasgow, the dear green place, the cathedral city, the crowded railway city, 
menaced by the motor car and the monster of rehousing, a city in turmoil, an ancient city on the edge of a new beginning.